Hey everybody, my name is Chris Morrill. I'm a senior product manager of technical products at uh, Amazon Alexa, focused on the books category of shopping and voice commerce, that intersection. And I'm here to talk to you today about a uh, suggestive topic. When in doubt, seek them out. And what uh, the teaser is, we're going to we're talking about customers. We're talking about customer feedback me mechanisms today. Brief introduction. Well, great news is we can already check that off. So we're going to do a little bit of uh, context setting. Then we're going to talk a little bit about a specific uh, feedback mechanism that I've used in the past called advisory panels. And then we'll end with a, a little bit of recap. Now, uh, just before we get started, the focus of my discussion is going to be on application. We're going to go through a little, little case study that's not fictional, I'm just drawing on examples from my product management everyday life and the situations that I've run into so that I can share some of the things that I learned along the way, things that have worked for me. And, and honestly, we're going to talk about some of the things that didn't work for me. The point is that after this talk, uh, I want you uh, to be able to take things away from this and, and go out and try them. I love... Uh, applied classes. So my discussions are always going to be around applied classes. And there's a, a key warning here, which is that this is neither mutually exclusive, nor is it collectively exhaustive. Uh, there are many, many different ways of uh, doing this. The purpose of this discussion is not to boil the ocean or present a theoretical examination of many possible frameworks for collecting customer feedback. I'm just going to talk to you about one that's worked for me. So customer feedback, and you can sort of start to read through the, uh, on the left is an app called Discord. And uh, during a uh, beta program that I ran, this was a, the bugs channel was always a, a popular place for people to uh, go in and report, you know, problems. And I use that to illustrate, um, you know, as a PM, I want to maximize the value of every feature. I'm constantly making trade-off decisions between customer value, uh, developer velocity, and time. And, and by developer velocity, I might mean you know, number of resources, because resources is a lever that we can pull. But I, I'm always thinking about what is that that customer value. And as I think about that, customer feedback alongside some uh, quantitative research uh, data that I have, having feedback from the actual customer, I find has uh, been a way to help crystallize some of what Customer value, so what the customer value is, and for new product development, especially in the spaces that I've worked in, where yes, there are similar use cases that I could look to. There were uh, there's innovation in adjacent spaces where I could take a you know a use case, but when it comes down to it, finding the right product market fit in these new product launches, new technology innovation, I found uh, that's where going and just directly speaking to a customer when I was in doubt was the fastest way to be a tiebreaker in a situation when maybe you know two data points disagreed or uh, maybe our design team was convinced that uh, one specific approach was better than another. Customer feedback has been that that way. Direct customer feedback has been that way that I found really helps. Um, and I've done this a couple of different ways in uh, you know th throughout my my product career. We're going to talk today about advisory panels, but as I alluded to in the image in the previous slide, there's also beta communities, which can be really useful ways of uh, gathering a, a small subset. Uh, a representative sample of your customer base, your target launch customer base, and giving them access to, uh, in a programmatic way, giving them access to early builds. You run into beta communities all the time. You're probably constantly opting into them. <laughs> I know I always opt into the best, the ones with the best of intentions, and then 
<laughs> probably never follow up on like half of them. I'm a terrible customer for being a product manager. Um, and then the other one that uh, I would say is um, post-launch engagement, which has also been useful to me, just sort of monitoring you know, what, what are the channels that uh, customers might use to uh, communicate with um, the company, the product team, monitoring those, and then just not being afraid to, if somebody trashes your product on Twitter, I mean, using judgment, but um, that's a place where I've gone and said, sounds like you've got a, it sounds like you care a lot about this product. What's making you so angry? Eh, sometimes uh, some of those conversations haven't been as useful, but uh most of the time, I take away at least uh, an understanding of a customer's uh, deep frustration point, and I try to compare that to, you know, did did I miss something in my prioritization framework? But let's not get crazy. We're just going to talk about one of those today, um, and let's talk about a couple of prerequisites. So, so before we get anywhere down the road of uh, talking about putting together an advisory panel, um. I had to be very clear on the target customer um, because at the end of the day, when I'm building an advisory panel, uh, it means that I've got a, a you know product in mind. I have a uh, you know a collection of resources and a timeline to deliver value with those resources that's in some way higher than the opportunity cost of whatever those resources you know could have been doing otherwise. So to get the most value out of an advisory panel, I have to be really clear on the target customer. Who are they? What do they look like? What do they like to do? Where do they hang out? Uh, how do they talk to each other? How do they solve problems? Being really clear on the uh, different dimensions of the customer, you know, one, even earlier on, helps me identify what's the uh, customer value. But then I can use those dimensions to start to pinpoint who are my early adopters? Who's going to care? You know, who's feeling this pain point that I'm solving? Who's feeling it most acutely? Who's going to be most excited that I'm solving this problem? And then here's where we get into um, you know some of the some of the soft skills. You know, reaching out and pitching them on participating in an advisory panel. I'll talk about that a little bit in a second about the the how, but. Then just sort of a, you know my my tip at the bottom of pitching an early adopter or several is a great indicator for product market fit, uh, especially you know depending on um, in the <laughs> actually I think I've found in both B two B and B two C use cases uh, early adopters are <laughs> always happy to tell you <laughs> that you're wasting their time and. The degree to which my target early adopters are receptive to uh, a, a pitch, uh, asking them if they'd like to be a, a um, part of my advisory committee or advisory panel, helps me sort of gauge how close I am to product market fit. If in my, you know, email outreach or LinkedIn or talking to somebody on the floor of a, you know, major conference or whatever channel I decide is is the right way to approach early adopters. If in that, you know, first couple of minutes, you know, they're interested, they understand the problem that I'm solving, they agree that it uh, there's a value to be solved. Um, then in that case, then. Uh, I know that I am closer to product market fit. <laughs> if I'm trying to explain the product to them or trying to explain the feature, the value, the pricing strategy, and they're just glazing over, I'm not getting much traction, it can signal me to go back and relook at my value proposition and relook at the customer problem. So uh, just a really great way to uh, sort of assess risk early. The picture in the background is uh, me and two other gentlemen um, pitching uh, some folks in a, this is just a pitch competition um, in business school. Why did I do a pitch competition? Because I had no idea how to pitch anything. Uh, I had done some persuasive speaking, but not a lot. So um, it's I just sort of used this picture as an example of, it was very un uncomfortable. Uh, I think it was just an awkward 
you know, I was dressed up in a suit, you know, I'm a, a, like tech why. Uh, but it taught me how to, you know, present things. Uh, and that I didn't realize at the time, but, but doing things like that uh, subsequently helped me. So we got a little bit of, so what, how does this help? Aside from what I've talked about already in terms of uh, faster achievement of product market fit and giving me some um, benefits in terms of feedback, which we'll, we're going to dive more into. Uh, another critical element of this, you know, even if you didn't care about the, the product market fit, is then thinking about feature launch. So establishing an advisory panel helps me enable... Uh, the measurement of customer satisfaction over time, whether I'm measuring that in, the, in a survey or uh, qualitative interview or, uh, you know, clickstream data, it enables me to start to measure uh, a benchmark, which then helps me start to think about, well, what is the, um, how satisfied do these customers need to be to be willing to pay for it, ultimately? Um, and, you know, how satisfied do they or whatever the K, you know, whatever the KPI is. Um, I've worked on products where we, um, what I established was a correlation between uh, customer satisfaction and uh, engagement over time, or some measure of value over time. And then the third thing that I think is sometimes, sometimes overlooked or has been in my experience is that if you crush it which is a completely technical term. Uh, but if you rock it in a beta and the folks in your beta, you know, product launches and they've got a sense of ownership, they feel like they've been heard during this beta, they walk out into the world telling everybody about it because they feel like it's not, it's not your, you know, it's not, it's not my product, it's our product, you know, that they fed into, you know, that they, hey, check out this little feature. I gave, you know, I gave the feedback. It's blue because I said, you know, red's an offensive color. <laughs> and just sort of making that up. But the uh, having those early adopters turn into evangelists is very, very useful. Uh, and I'll talk about that more. Uh it's very useful at launch and and beyond when those early adopters turn into uh, it in some way drive adoption of uh, additional customers, whether it's through network effects um, or or through uh, you know sort of a head torso tail business where the head of the business defines uh, what the torso of the business will do. Um, we're going to talk about this situation called Skillflow Builder. Uh, this product. Um, that I shipped, but uh, I realized I would be amiss to proceed without describing what's an advisory panel. <laughs> an advisory panel, simply put, is like a small-scale uh, beta community. It is a, it, in a situation in which um, I'm looking for consistent feedback from a regular group of customers that represents the uh, target segment that I'm going to go after at product launch. I am looking for between three and five customers. Uh, in this case, uh, I've used advisory advisory committees in, in times in uh, B2B situations where it's not feasible to have 200 companies participating in a, um, in a beta uh, or uh, situations where uh, someone's, it, the customer's time is expensive or the customer is not easily accessible. And so representing, finding three to five um, customers who are accessible or I'm willing to pay the cost of accessing them because they represent you know, a, a broader market is when I uh, look to assemble a, uh, an advisory uh, panel over a, um, over a beta community. An advisory panel can be... Um, Sometimes I may be looking for more um, strategic feedback versus uh, tactical feedback. Uh, and as in the, usually when I have executed beta panels, uh, those are, uh, it's more tactical feedback. It's a A B study, it's a, or it's a, uh, you know, it's an A B test, it's a uh, pricing study, it's a, you know, comparing one feature to another. And with a 
advisory panel. Sometimes I won't. Um, the with an advisory panel, the trade off is most of the feedback is going to be qualitative, so it's going to be more uh, directional in nature. Broad takeaway: advisory panel, three to five. Uh, three to five customers representative of the target customer that I'm going to go after. Uh, and they uh, will assist in from the, you know, can can be helpful as soon as I start contemplating a feature uh, or solving a customer problem all the way through product launch uh, and beyond. So let's talk a little bit about Skillflow Builder. So the goal was um, notice this problem of um, developing uh, voice interactive entertainment experiences was very difficult and was especially frustrating for to uh, professional developers who maybe come from industries where tooling is uh, industry tooling is mature and fully featured and usually available as a as a service coming into developing for voice interactive experiences where there was less tooling and uh, and they and the existing tools were less mature. So the goal was at the end of the day to enable development, uh, faster development of these experiences for professional developers. And there was a key there of professional developers in that we were not for the purposes of this product, we're not going to tailor towards uh, hobbyists or um, uh, developers, uh, a single person developing a, a, a small shop, somebody, uh, a hobbyist, somebody not doing it for a living. Uh, and so our, our target customers were these early to mid stage studios, some agencies, and a, a key insight that we guided much of the early product development was discovering through some initial customer interviews that, uh, as is potentially obvious, but that these uh, customers have very low risk for uh, unproven technology because they're in a content production flow where they want that production process to be as deterministic as, as possible. Uh, and when I say deterministic, I mean that the um, inputs and the amounts of time and the output of a process is as uh, there is as little variance as possible uh, in differences between running the process. Uh, whereas non, you know, non-deterministic process, uh, you know, I don't know, I can put it in an apple and it comes out a, a carrot with legs. That's a non-deterministic process <laughs> and a horrific example. <laughs> you can a, a, a better example of a non-deterministic process might be. If a um, if we're doing creative exploration, so in a creative exploration where uh, we are brainstorming for um, a new, we're doing a brainstorm that's non-deterministic. The inputs uh, and outputs may not match from one brainstorming session to another, and that's uh, by design. Great, excellent segue. So. Just this re recaps a little bit, um, but so the advisory committee, we built relationships within Skillflow Builder, built relationships with three target companies. Important here that they were representative of the segment that I was uh, pursuing because what I was looking for was fidelity of signal that at the end of the day, when I'm talking to the advisory committee, I want feedback from them that is representative of the broader market. And what we did is um, gave them a seat at the table. So involve them in uh, early uh, early feature design meetings, early wireframing. We even involved some of them in some early brainstorming, uh, helping them, giving them a sense of ownership as much as possible um, was a what was key to them feeling like they could participate and that their feedback was heard uh, and that 
they generally speaking understood some of the you know trade-off decisions that we were making, which helped lower the perceived risk of them adopting the products that we were developing. We also, I found, uh, a, a great use uh, for their uh, of of time with them was problem solving. If we identified a, a, a problem with really difficult trade-offs, one of the first places I would go is just reach out to them. In a previous talk, I discussed a, a difference between you know their scrappy and their spendy ways to to get things done as a product manager, and sometimes it's just as scrappy as reaching out to a guy on Slack or talking to a designer on LinkedIn saying, hey, we, we've got this problem, this really thorny issue. Here are the trade-offs. I mean, you know, what do you think? And getting that additional feedback of someone outside the team who potentially would have to adopt this or use this in the future, gain some really great perspective. And then we, you know, we couldn't always give them everything that they wanted. You know, the the backlog was always much, much longer than what they were, uh, what we were able to deliver. But we were always explicit with them with why we were making, what was the prioritization framework? Why were we, why were we making the trade-off decisions that we were making? And that came to be very helpful, especially uh, as we, we ended up expanding into a broader beta what we found is that they would then answer questions for other beta members. So when another beta member might say, well, I really wanted feature X, before I could even go answer that question or comment, someone from the advisory committee had already had already answered it, which was tremendously helpful. Um, so let's just take, you know, move out of the theoretical and into the, you know, and into the actual Let's talk a little bit of a day in the life, uh, and this is a this is absolutely real. So, uh, on the left hand side, what you see is a uh, syntax, a simplified syntax that's based around narrative uh, and the expression of narrative interaction with a uh, a an Alexa device, where the Interaction pattern is the Alexa device says something, the customer says something. The Alexa device says something, the customer device says something. This syntax is built around facilitating that interaction. Uh, early in this product development, the uh, team said, uh, designers and writers will learn to use the SFB, in this case, that's skill flow builder syntax using code editors like VS Code. And, you know, exhibit A to your left. The product manager, who happens to have a, a Bachelor of Arts degree, boldly states, no creative will ever write in this, never. The fervor of that statement, the uh, passion, if you will, falls upon deaf ears. Uh, the team is completely unconvinced and uh, is believes that the the best way the best path to market is to ship only modules and a state machine that process this syntax without any visual affordances whatsoever challenge accepted so again real life said product manager emails one of our advisory committee advisory panel members, and sets up a, a meeting with two of their designers and a writer to get some feedback on this syntax. That PM also invites the entire team to attend and has the designer, uh, our team's designer, walk the uh, members from the, uh, the advisory panel, walk them through this syntax and get their feedback which generates this verbatim. We will never, ever, period, ever exclamation point, write story in a code editor, which is why <laughs> eight months later when we shipped the product, there was a React-based desktop application 
that was an abstraction on top of that syntax. We didn't get we didn't get rid of the syntax. The syntax was useful. And I will say, as much as it pains me to say this, truly, it was my the engineering team that proposed that. They did have the last laugh because not 18 months later, after we had uh, launched this product, a designer from that advisory panel company ended up saying that what she found so great about the product was the syntax. And she loved that she had learned the syntax. And once she learned the syntax, it gave her so much flexibility and freedom and she could work so much faster. And so it was on that day that I actually uh, went back to the team and said, you know what, you were right. And if we could have just gotten more designers and writers to ramp on it, maybe we could have shipped without a uh, visual editor, but I'm, I'm not sorry. The, I think some other things that the advisory panel um, did for us was certainly around uh, beta testing. So once, you know, moving out of sort of an early alpha phase uh, into, you know, sort of first requirements and then more formal beta testing, once we had, you know, collections of features available, they were very helpful as super users in those beta tests. And, and I had to be careful to um, not over-index on their feedback because they were already familiar with the product and its use cases. And so had to make sure that the betas were uh, consisted of both uh, members of our advisory panel, but also uh, other, other uh, companies that we'd solicited to make sure to balance that feedback out. But they, they're also phenomenal at, at pointing out edge cases that just aren't obvious to the team as we are building, you know, day to day, especially around uh, things around different uh, operating systems, edge cases in uh, tech documentation or blind spots in our tech documentation, uh, open questions about, well, will you support this SDK or this SDK? What will you do when this SDK, you know, is end of life? Those types of helping the team uh, look ahead and and come out of the sort of day to day feature development uh, that could be very focused in the in the nitty gritty. That was uh, really useful, and then also establishing uh, that exit criteria, which I discussed a little bit at the as as part of the the so what you know the what is that uh, CSAT threshold for. Not and, and not only what what is the CSAT threshold that you know that's sort of the the launch criteria, but by exit criteria in this case I'm talking about confirming my hypothesis on the mix of features that collectively represent enough customer value uh, to overcome barriers to adoption. So an exit criteria saying we are. The product is is we are ready to exit beta and to move into a, a launch once we have X number of features and have met Y customer satisfaction. Because those two things, I am confident that if we have both of those, we will achieve product market fit and have a successful product on our hands. So this is a uh, sort of the result of, of what happens at launch when you launch with an advisory panel. So this is um, a small um, company called Electronic Arts, and they uh, were members of the advisory panel. And as you can see in the verbatim, uh, there's some discussion about around using tools for developing. Uh, in this case, they reference Skillflow Builder. And... Um, the results of of sort of forming this committee and making sure that they were they were with us uh, the all the way from you know pre pre technical alpha all the way through post product launch was we went and instead of a member of the team uh, or a member from management announcing the the product at a at a um, industry conference we had someone from the advisory committee or someone from the advisory panel. Uh, announced, and it was um, uh, some folks from um, 
Electronic Arts that ended up announcing that uh, that product on stage. And it was the product was adopted and it was successful. And if as I as I looked back over the hundreds of decisions that we as product managers, you know, make over the course of a, a product's life cycle. I think about all of the the small decisions that later proved to be impactful and the difference between the successful product and a not successful product was the times where I remembered a verbatim or stopped long enough to to give somebody a call or send a text message and ask, hey, you know, what do you think about this? You know, how would you think about this problem? And ultimately what it did is it it earned trust with the target customers because instead of trying to drive adoption from a perspective of you should try this, the adoption message was show, not tell. Take it from these three customers who participated in this in this uh, phase of, of product development, ask them. And having those verbatims helped tremendously. Uh, and this is actually a uh, sort of an overview of the stage at the, um, that was at the industry event where it was announced. I think this was right before, uh, right before it was announced. Just recapping in general, what we have talked about. So uh, just want to honor that talking to customers is hard. Uh, but it's worth it. I completely acknowledge and have experienced multiple times that finding those initial customers, uh, zeroing in on them, walking up to somebody and saying, hey, I have this idea, or hey, I think this is a problem, you know, or hey, talk to me about your experience with a problem. Uh, it can be a little, it can be a bit intimidating, it can be, um, it can feel unnatural. What I've found is that it's very worth it uh, and that there are many different ways to ensure that I've got the right amount of customer feedback as I go through the product development uh, life cycle. But advisory panels are one that we've, we've talked about today. Again, about three to five uh, participants who uh, can talk both strategically and and tactically. They're more valuable at the uh, outset of, of product development as I'm, uh, well, I'm still trying to refine uh, feature requirements while I'm still trying to determine product market fit. And in fact, one technique to remember is that um, pitching early adopters can be a great way to get a indicator as to if you've achieved product market fit, because if you have you'll know because you'll have really quickly, you'll have a short list of early adopters who want to be on your advisory panel. Uh, and then there's other ways of, of generating sustained customer feedback like beta panels and um, also monitoring post-launch channels of communication. Um, and then ultimately, advisory panels have helped me launch many products in my over my product management career. Uh, and it is always humbling as a, as a product manager to, to see where others have come together and contributed towards uh, some, towards a, a, a feature or product that I'm launching because they leave their sort of their fingerprints um, on the on the product, which um, to me is always is always inspiring. I'd always rather build, products together. I just enjoy it more. Uh, so that's it. Uh, thank you very much. Again, Chris Morrow, feel free to reach out to me uh, on LinkedIn. Always happy to connect and continue the conversation. And thank you so much to Product School for having me. I always enjoy these talks.